In this presentation, we will take a look at the teachings of the Savior in Matthew chapter 5 and Luke chapter 6. Let's first turn to Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, as a prelude to the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke chapter 6, verse 12, it says, or we see Jesus praying all night to receive direction from on high so that he could call his 12 apostles the next day. This is not recorded in Matthew, but in Luke, he was doing this prior to the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke chapter 12, verses 17 through 19, Jesus comes down from the mountain where he had prayed and chose the 12 and heals all that were sick and afflicted who came to hear him. Thus, the Sermon on the Mount are the steps on how to become spiritually healed and instructions for the newly ordained apostles to open the door of spiritual progress for all newly called members of the church and the kingdom of God on earth. In the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 5, 3 through 4, it reads, Blessed are they who shall believe on me, and again, more blessed are they who shall believe on your, the apostles' words, when ye shall testify that ye have seen me and that I am. Yea, blessed are they who shall believe on your words and come down to the depths of humility and be baptized in my name. For they shall be visited with fire in the Holy Ghost and shall receive a remission of your sins. Notice that was given all prior to his saying, Blessed are ye, the, the Beatitudes. Thus, the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount is meant for those who have entered God's kingdom through baptism and the reception of the Holy Ghost. It is not meant for people in the world in general. So these are instructions for newly baptized members of the church. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 1 through 12 are the Beatitudes. A beatitude is to beautify, is to make supremely happy, or to announce that a person has attained the blessedness of heaven. Beatitude is a state of utmost bliss. The Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 5.5 5 about blessed are the poor says, Yea, blessed are the poor in spirit who come unto me, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice he adds, who come unto me. The footnote in the King James Version of chapter Matthew 5, verse 3b, blessed are the poor, meaning the poor in pride, those who are able to cast off the cares, burdens, and riches of the world, to cast off worldliness and set their hearts upon the riches of eternity. So that's the poor that he has in mind, not necessarily material things. Matthew 5, 4, blessed who mourn. Those who mourn because of their wickedness or fallen nature will receive comfort by yielding to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and put off the natural man and become a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord and becometh as a child submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him, even as a child does submit to his father. Do you notice how all these build upon each other? If I am poor and pride, if I humble myself, then I will mourn for my weaknesses and seek to come unto Christ. A knowledge and witness of the plan of salvation also brings comfort to those who mourn because of the loss of loved ones. So it also applies to that. Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek. The meek are those who who, that should be who, voluntarily humble themselves. Those who are the God-fearing and the righteous seldom hold title to much of what appears appertains to this present world. They shall be the Lord's jewels and inherit the earth as the celestial kingdom. Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. The Joe Smith translation, Matthew 5, 6, reads, And blessed are they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. That is what's added that's not in the King James Version. As starving men crave a crust of bread, as choking men thirst for water, so do the righteous yearn for the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a revelator. He is a sanctifier. He reveals truth and he cleanses human souls. Matthew 5, Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful. 
every man is rewarded according to the deeds done in the flesh. Those who have done mercy, have manifest mercy to their fellow men here will be treated mercifully by the merciful one. Those who have acquired the godly attribute of mercy will have mercy restored to them again in that bright day. Notice this is what Alma teaches in Alma 41, 13 through 15. Alma says, The meaning of the word restoration is to bring back evil, again, evil for evil, or carnal for carnal, or devilish for devilish, good for that which is good, righteousness, righteous for that which is righteous, just for that which is just, merciful for that which is merciful. Therefore, my son, see that you are merciful unto your brethren. Deal justly, judge righteously, and do good continually. And if you do all these things, then you shall receive your reward. Yea, you shall have mercy restored unto you again. You shall have justice restored unto you again. You shall have a righteous judgment restored unto you again. And you shall have good reward rewarded unto you again. For that which ye do send out shall return unto you again and be restored. Therefore, the word restoration more fully condemneth the sinner and justifieth him not at all. So we will be our own harshest judge. We will decide how much mercy, justice, righteousness we get by how much we gave. Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart. It is the pure in heart that says in this beatitude that see and dwell with God. Doctrine and Covenants 93.1 says, Verily thus saith the Lord, and it shall come to pass that every soul who forsaketh his sins, and cometh unto me, and calleth on my name, and obey my voice, and keepeth my commandments, shall see my face, and know that I am. So a part of being the pure in heart is, forsake our sins, come unto Christ, call on his name, obey his voice, and keep his commandments. Also, we learn from Psalms 24, 3 through 4, it says, Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. And now he, the psalmist defines that. The clean hands are they who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity. Those who have righteous actions, their acts, the things they do, they commit. And pure heart is those who, sworn, who have not sworn deceitfully. Brothers and sisters, we cannot make oaths and covenants and then not live up to them and be pure in heart. We covenant every week in the sacrament, make an oath in the name of Christ. If we purposely then that week disobey the gospel, not keep the commandments, then we are swearing deceitfully. Therefore, we are not the pure in heart. Do not partake of the sacrament if you're going to break the commandments, because then you're swearing deceitfully. Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers are those who are willing to preach Christ and his gospel, since he is the prince of peace. Notice what Isaiah 52, 7 says, quoting Isaiah, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publish peace, that bring good tidings of good, that publish salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Anyone who's willing to preach Christ is a peacemaker. And to those who respond to such preaching, and now because of the covenant which you have made, you shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he has spiritually begotten you. For you say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore you are born of him and become his sons and his daughters. That's Mosea 5, 7. So those who respond to the preaching of Christ become his sons and daughters through entering the covenant of baptism. Matthew 5, 10 through 12, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. The world loves its own and hates the saints. The world is the carnal society created by evil men. It is made up of those who are carnal and sensual and devilish. Of course, the world persecutes the saints. The very thing that makes them saints is their enmity towards the things of the world. Now, in Luke chapter 6, 24 through 26, after Luke giving the Sermon on the Mount, the Savior then gave four curses. 
There is always oppositional things where there are blessings. There are also curses if you don't live up to the law of the blessings. So Luke 24, 6, 24-26 reads, But woe unto you that are rich, for ye shall have your consolation. He's talking about those who focus only on material things and focus on the world. You already have your reward. Enjoy it while you can. Woe unto you that are full, ye shall hunger. Those who already think they have everything and they don't need the gospel, I have enough. I don't need any more. I'm content. I'm fine with the things of the world. They will hunger later. Woe unto you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Those who just laugh at righteousness, those who laugh at those who live the gospel and keep the commandments, those who are of the world and just partake of the follies of the world, they will mourn and weep later. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Woe unto those who just seek after the praise of the world. Even false prophets got praised. Brother Bruce R. McConkie writes, If there is a blessing, there must be a cursing. There can be no light without darkness, no good without evil, no blessed heights of glory and honor, unless there are also cursed depths of despair and damnation. If the pure in heart shall see God, those whose hearts are impure shall be shut out of his presence. If the peacemakers shall be called the children of God, those who ferment war shall be the children of Lucifer, their father. If those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, those whose appetites are fed on carnal and evil food shall be filled with a worldly spirit that breeds evil deeds, and so on with reference to all the Beatitudes. All things have their opposites, and there must needs be an opposition in all things. In Matthew 5.13, the Savior then tells his newly members of the church, you are to be the salt of the earth. The Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 5.15 reads, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I give unto you to be the salt of the earth. We are his baptized members. But if the salt shall lose its savor, wherein shall the earth be salted? The salt shall, thence, the salt shall thenceforth be good for nothing but to be cast out and be trotted under the foot of man. Doctrine and Covenants, section 101, verses 39 through 40, gives us more insight to what the Savior is talking about. It says, When men are called into my everlasting gospel and covenant with an everlasting covenant, so they enter through the covenant of baptism and then later through temple covenants, they are accounted as the salt of the earth, the savor of men. They are called to be the savor of men. Therefore, if the salt of the earth loses its savor, behold, it is good for nothing, only to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. In other words, if we do not keep our covenants, brothers and sisters, and become an example to the world, then we are good for nothing, but to be trodden under the foot of man. The salt of the earth means those who have entered into the covenant of baptism and unto the covenants of the temple. If we don't keep those, we are not good for anything. Matthew 5, 14 through 16, the famous quote is verses on we are to be a light of the world. We are to be the choicest and best people on earth, and we must now be an example to all men, that others, seeing our good works, shall come unto Christ and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Salt and light are symbols of the saints. Salt because it has a seasoning, purifying, preserving power. Light because it manifests the good works and wise words of the true believers. The saints, as the salt of the earth, are set forth to season their fellow man, to keep society free from corruption, to help their fellow saint beings become wholesome, pure, and acceptable before the Lord. The saints, as the light of the world, are, set an, are to set an example of the good works and charitable deeds, so that they may say to all men, as their, does their master, follow thou me, and I will lead you in sure paths here, and the heights above the clouds hereafter. Third Nephi 18.24 talks about the light we are to hold up, not our own, but it says, Therefore hold up your light, that it may shine into the world. Behold, I I am the light which ye shall hold up. So we don't hold ourselves up. We hold up the light of Christ and the Holy Ghost that is in us. That which ye have seen me do, 
Behold, ye see that I have prayed unto the Father, and ye all have witnessed. Now, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, Christ talks about how the law of Moses is fulfilled. Sister Tracy Y. Browning writes uh, in this last general conference, By the time of the Savior's ministry, the Israelites had lost sight of Christ in their observances, setting him aside and adding to the law unauthorized practices that had no instructive symbolism pointing to the true and only source of their salvation and redemption, Jesus Christ. The very the everyday world of the Israelites had become disoriented and obscure. The children of Israel in this state believed that the practices and rituals of the law were the path to personal salvation, and in part reduced the law of Moses to a set of protocols administered to rule civilian life. This required the Savior to restore focus and clarity to the Gospels. They had changed the law of Moses into salvation itself, not pointing to Christ, but the law would save them. Back to Sister Browning. Ultimately, a great portion of the Israelites rejected his message, even going as far to accuse the Savior, he who gave the law and declared that he was the law and the light, of breaking it. Yet Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, speaking of the law of Moses, declared, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Then the Savior, through his eternal atonement, ended the codes, regulations, and ceremonial practices observed by the people of Israel at that time. His final sacrifice led the shift from sacrificial burnt offerings to our rendering of a broken heart and a contrite spirit from the ordinance of sacrifice to the ordinance of sacrament. How the law of Moses is fulfilled in Christ and the gospel is, was written well by Stephen E. Robinson, professor of BYU. He writes, It is vital to note that in the teachings of Jesus, the law was not revoked nor repealed, but fulfilled. Under the gospel of Christ, murder, adultery, and dishonesty are still prohibited, and the former requirements of the law are still essentially in place. But the demand of the law of Moses has been expanded, has been fulfilled to its fullest extent. Now he explains what he means by that. Where there is no hatred or greed, there can be no murder. That's why he says, now I say unto you, don't be angry with one another. Then there wouldn't be any murder. Notice see, it, it encompasses the old law. Where there is no lust, there can be no adultery. That's why he says, Thou, now I say to you, do not lust. With the coming of Christ, the ethical portion of the law had not been abolished. It had been caught up by, included in, and expanded to a broader application of its intention. Its potential as an ethical standard had been fulfilled. The ceremonial portions of the law, however, were fulfilled in a different way. These were not moral ethical rules which could be transformed into broader principles, but were what Abinadi and Alma called performances, rituals that symbolically pre prefigured coming historical events. For example, animal sacrifice prefigured the future sacrifice of the Savior, the Lamb of God. But when the event prefigured actually occurred, they could no longer be anticipated. They could only be remembered. After the atonement of Christ, the anticipation of the event found in the law was replaced by the remembrance of the event, which is part of the gospel. Thus, those parts of the law which anticipated the atonement of Christ were fulfilled in the events of the atonement and had an end, just as a prophecy is said to be fulfilled when the event prophesied takes place. So that's why we now take the sacrament in remembrance. The event of Christ's atonement has already been fulfilled, which the law of sacrifice of animals under the Mosaic law pointed to. Now we turn in Matthew 5, 21 through 47. Christ now gives examples of of the law of the gospel expand, encompassing and expanding the law of Moses. Notice the law of Moses taught all these things, but now it's expanded under the gospel law. 
the Savior now says, Matthew 5, 21 through 22, I, I know there will not be murder if you'll get rid of anger. So he talks about murder and anger. The same prohibition applies under the gospel law, but this higher law, in addition, raises a higher standard. It strikes at the cause of murder, which is anger. The man whose fired bullet missed its human target is as guilty as the marksman whose bullet brings to death to the intended victim. It is the feeling one has in his heart that counts, not the eventuality that occurs. So that's why he says, get rid of anger. He now talks about Matthew 5.22, profanity. Raka and thou fool were epithets of profanity and vulgar speech in Christ's day. And when profanity and vulgar words are hurled at our fellow man, that leads to damnation. So he says, get rid of your vulgar speech. Matthew 5, 23 through 24. Now he wants us to not just not be angry with each other, but to reconcile between brethren. Jesus speaks here not of our anger or ill feelings towards others, but of their ill feelings for whatever cause against us. No matter that we are the ones who has been wronged. The gospel standard calls for each of us to search out those whose anger is, a kin is kindled against us and to do all in our power to dose the fires of hate and um animosity. Go thy way unto thy brother and first be reconciled to thy brother, he said to the Nephites, and then come unto me with full purpose of heart and I will receive you. So not are we not to be angry with each other, but we are to seek out those who are angry with us and to try to work it out. Matthew 5, 25 through 26, the Savior now talks about avoiding legal, legal entanglements. That's what those verses are referring to. It was more important during their social and political circumstances that the Lord's servants suffer legal wrongs than that their ministers be hindered or even stopped by legal processes. Perhaps even today we do not need to sue for every little thing. You didn't have to take everything to court. Matthew 5, 27 through 28, he now addresses adultery. It is not the immoral act alone that the gospel condemns. It is also the lewd and lustful desires that lead to its commission. Matthew 5, 29 through 30, he talks about casting away our sins in a short little parable. The Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 5, 32-34 reads this way, Wherefore, if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it out from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of the, thy members should perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. Or if the right hand offend thee, cut it off, cast it off from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of the members should perish, not that the whole body should be cast into hell. And then Joseph Smith added, which was originally there, to let us know the Savior wasn't talking literally. He now adds, And now this I speak a parable concerning your sins. Wherefore, cast them from you, that you may not be hewn down and cast into the fire. Just as you would get rid of an offending member of the body that would destroy the whole body, you'd cut part of it out. Just like cancer, you cut it out. Do the same with your sins. Cut it out of you. Get rid of it. Matthew 5, 31 through 32, the Savior now talks about divorce. Under the Mosaic law and in our society, God permits a bill of divorcement. But, as Ella Bruce R. McConkie writes, Divorce is totally foreign to celestial standards, a verity that Jesus will one day expound in more detail to the people of Jewry. For now, as far as the record reveals, he merely specifies the higher law that his people should live, but that is beyond our capacity even today. If husband and wives lived the law as the Lord would have them live it, they would neither do nor say the things that would even permit the fleeting thought of divorce to enter the mind of their eternal companions. Though we today have the gospel, we have yet to grow into that higher state of marital association where marrying a divorced person constitutes adultery. The Lord has not yet given us the higher standard 
he here named as that which ultimately will replace the mosaic practice of writing a bill of divorcement. So Christ gives the higher law. There is no divorcement in the celestial kingdom, brothers and sisters. And so he's saying we one day have got to get to that state. But right now, he still allows it even in our society. We are not living the higher law of marital status and divorce in the church. God is still working on it with that, with us on that. Matthew 5, 38-37, Jesus now talks about gospel oaths. Abraham and the ancients who lived by gospel standards were permitted to take oaths to swear in the Lord's name, thus certifying that they would act or speak in a named way. Such a certification guaranteed their words because the oath made God their partner, and God cannot lie or fail. The words they then spoke became the Lord's words and were accepted as true, and the deeds they vowed by in an oath to do became the Lord's performance, and they must be done at the peril of one's life, for God has all power and he cannot fail in any particular to do that which he is and he cannot fail in any particular to do that which he is bound to do. Under the perfect law of Christ, every man's word is his bond. You don't have to swear by God. And all spoken statements are as true as though an oath attended each spoken word. The Savior now, Matthew 5, 38-39, talks about mercy to temper justice. The law of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was a law of restoration or restitution. It was not a law of retribution. If someone had, had injured or taken something, then there was to be restitution of equal value. An eye for an eye. You give equal value. Jesus is now saying that maybe we do not always have to exact justice all the time. And mercy can be given instead. Contention leads to bitterness and smallness of soul. Persons who contend with each other, shrivel up spiritually, are in danger of losing their salvation. So important is it to avoid this evil that Jesus expects his saints to suffer oppression and wrong rather than lose their inner peace and serenity through contention. So yes, if I sin... I should restore the best I can and of equal value for what I have destroyed. But he is saying maybe there are times we just give mercy and I don't always have to seek justice from somebody. In Matthew 5, 40-42, he now talks about persecution by legal process. Nothing is so important as the spread of truth and the establishment of the cause of righteousness. The petty legal processes of that day must not be permitted to impede the setting up of the new kingdom. Don't get caught up in petty little legal things that will keep you from building the kingdom of God, is what he's referring to. Matthew 5, 43-47, the Savior now talks about the law of love. Of olden time and in ages past, Israel's enemies had been God's enemies, and the Gentile nations were kept away at sword's point. Had it not been so, the chosen people would have been swallowed up by the world. Their world was one of force and violence in which whole nations were forced to believe what the rulers decreed or be destroyed from off the face of the earth. This tight grip on the minds of men has now been loosened. And now the gospel is to go to the world. All men everywhere are to hear the word. Israel must love the Gentiles, for they are to be adopted into the family of Jehovah. All men will be judged by what is in his own hearts. If their souls are full of hatred and cursings, such characteristics shall be restored to them in the resurrection. Loving one's enemies and blessing one's curses perfects the soul. Such perfection is the object of the gospel, and of it Jesus now chooses to speak. Matthew 5.48 talks about now perfection. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven which is perfected. If the newly called saints overcome anger, 
If they are reconciled with their brethren, if they rise above lewd and lascivious thoughts and commit no adultery in their hearts, if they cast away their sins as though severing an offending hand, if their every spoken word is true as though sworn with an oath, if they do not retaliate when others offend them, if they turn the other cheek and resist no evil impositions, if they love their enemies, bless those who curse them, and pray for those who despitefully use them and persecute them, if they do all these things, they will become perfect, even as their eternal Father is perfect. And perfection comes not by the law of Moses, but by the gospel. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron, Paul said in Hebrews 7.11. But thanks be to God, another priest, Jesus, the Son of God, arose and ministered in all the glory of the gospel. He is now fulfilling the old law and inviting men to believe and obey the new law. If we will work on keeping the Beatitudes and this Sermon on the Mount, we will get rid of those things in our heart that keeps us from Christ, that keeps us from becoming like our Heavenly Father. Now, another comment about this word perfection, be therefore perfect, that brings a lot of anxiety to a lot of people. What did he mean by that? Obviously, he did not mean be like me down here on earth. That is not what Heavenly Father meant. We cannot do that. Brigham Young said this, after quoting, Be therefore perfect, as your Father in him which is perfect, Brigham Young said this, If the first passage I have quoted is not worded to our understanding, we can alter the phraseology of the sentence and say, Be ye as perfect as ye can, for that is all we can do. Though it is written, Be ye perfect as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. He cannot be any more perfect than he knows how, any more than we. When we are doing as well as we know how, in the sphere and station in which we occupy here, we are justified in the justice, righteousness, mercy, and judgment that go before the Lord of heaven and earth. We are as just as the angels who are before the throne of God. The sin that will cleave to all the posterity of Adam and Eve is that they have not done as well as they knew how. If I will live up to the best I know how and what I've been taught down here, then I am living, be therefore perfect as your Father in heaven. And in the next life, I will learn more to become like Christ and be perfected in him. The danger is we don't live up to how Uh, We don't live up to all that we know down here. Am I living up to everything I know that I should be doing? That is the question. That is a part of being perfect. Live as well as you know how and what you have been taught. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.